Kevin Ashton is the co-founder and former executive director of the MIT Auto ID Center and is well known for coining the term, the Internet of Things. He likes to geek out over, out over video games, dogs, typography, books, roller derby, Harry Potter, and brunch. He should be right at home here. His new book, How to Fly a Horse, The Secret History of Creation, Invention, and Discovery, is available now and came out in January. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Ashton. So, as Noah mentioned, I'm the Internet of Things guy. And what you don't know is I have special software that is going to analyze this photograph to see who's not paying attention. <laughs> it will identify you and embarrass you on the internet. <laughs> like, any, any second now, because I'm going to put this on Twitter right away, so we can see ourselves on the wall. You may, you may look at yourself on your electronic devices or email or whatever you want to do. So um, I just did something that like, I don't know, six years ago would have been totally amazing. I took this tiny device out of my pocket and took a high definition panoramic photograph in Toronto and right now it's, it's available to people all over the world. And probably the only thing most of you were thinking was, oh my god, is that an iPhone 5? I can't believe he doesn't have an iPhone 6 already. Um, which is instructive because as we think about new technology, um, particularly as we think about ebooks and publishing, this is often the reaction. Um, so the sort of topic to get us started this morning is uh, the e-bookalypse, which is like the zombie apocalypse, but with, with books. Um, and we're going to talk about how we're going to survive. No shotguns required. There will be no beheadings. Um, and, you know, the subtitle is, is a history of the end of reading, because maybe you know, maybe you don't but um, we live in an age of paranoia about reading and publishing, uh, but that's actually not a new thing. That's, that's been around for a while. Um, and this is the kind of thing that you can read. This is, there's, there's one of these every day. Somebody somewhere explaining, in this case, oh my goodness, we're in this historic transition because of technology, and you probably don't mean maybe to tell you that the rest of this report is doom and gloom. Um, children are looking at screens, they're not reading books, oh no. Um, here's another one. The end of reading as we know it, going back to oral, oral culture only says Tina Brown, former editor of, I think she was at Vanity Fair for a while, and the Daily Beast, and the Sunday Times in, in London. Um, this was a delightful one. I had to read a whole bunch of these to make these slides, and uh, this, this was a standout. This was thousands of words in the New York Times a few months ago. Um, the streets are haunted by, you know, ghosts, s slain corpses of thugs. Um, that means Nathan from Kobo, by the way, um, particularly being called out there. You can't make the names up on these people either. I've always thought it's funny. Will Self being, you know, this, the jokes tell themselves, but, um, uh, you know, serious readers, deep serious readers, uh, will be in short supply. That specifically, by the way, I'm pretty sure means people who would read his book. <laughs> his book didn't sell very well, but the reason was not it was a bad book, it was that there just weren't enough intelligent people around to, to really understand, like the good old days. Um, and 
One of the one of the uh, we'll talk about these these people a little bit more, but but um, one of the beautiful characteristics of these essays, and as I say, there are many, 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 many. They're all the same. Lots of hand wringing. Um, is they are almost always completely free of any verifiable facts. You can tell that somebody had a thesaurus next to them when they were writing it. Uh, and generally, they are somebody who has just lost their publishing job or their book didn't sell very well. Um, but occasionally, you do get a little bit of data. And so this is, this is one of the few bits of data that I was able to find in any of these, these you know, zombie apocalypse predictions. Um, and it's the percentage of American adults who did not, not read a book. Um, uh, every few years, somebody does a survey, and they ask this question, and oh heavens, you know, since 1978, it's gone from 8% who said they did not read a book. We may be measuring how embarrassed people are to admit that they didn't read a book, right, um, to 23%. And this is one of the few, the few facts. Um, and from these few facts, there's a lot of extrapolation, right? Uh, and here, here is something to be afraid of. Here is the modern day equivalent of the people screaming. Um, this, is, this is a screen from a video game. It's one of my favorite video games at the moment, actually. It's, it's quite a new one. Um, and you can be the monster or you can be the guys trying to kill the monster, which may be metaphorical in this context. But um, uh, so one of the things that all these very disappointed 60-something, nearly always male, definitely always white, very privileged writers will tell you is that one of the reasons nobody is reading anymore is because of video games. And it is true. Um, more video games are being sold today than were being sold before video games were invented. <laughs> uh, and if you get your axes just right, you can make it look really dramatic, right? So that monster that's rampaging towards you is, is selling all these millions of, of units. This is units sold. So about 800 million units. This is not video game consoles, this is just the games. This is what is stealing your deep, serious readers. Um, and so that, that title slide I showed you was a little montage I made of these glorious 1950s American movie posters. And as I was putting them together, I noticed this common theme which we can spot fairly quickly. So here's one. Um, and oh look, it's two respectable looking white people fleeing. And the man is protecting the woman from something. And you'll notice in this one, um, you know, the spider has already, already captured one of these poor white women. So this white man is you know, saving his white woman from this thing. This is 1950s America, so just think about what this might be, right? Uh, and here's another one. There's a thing, and the thing, again, is grabbing the white woman. But this very hard jawed man is somehow, with his tie on, without removing his tie, is, is going to save her and her pearls. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, here we are again. Here we are again. And so when you see these, these essays and these stories from these, these privileged white New York people complaining about how everything is terrible and the, the, the written word is, is dying, and, and these are the people I want you to imagine, okay? Because what these movies are about is rich, white, elite suddenly realizing everybody else is going to get a piece of the action too. Yeah, in, in 19, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Selma March in, in the United States, where I live, um, which was a you know, civil rights protest. And obviously, what they're, they're afraid about here is the black people are coming. That's what they're really afraid of in the 1950s, and that's why all these posters show this. Uh, but the more general thing is, 
is equality is happening. That's the fear. Um, you know, the plebs are, are starting to, to become educated. And I can show you that. So that's enough of me moaning about, almost enough of me moaning about the, the complaining essayists. Um, let's look at this chart again, because this is kind of interesting when we look at this chart. If you're someone who likes data, like I do, because the first thing you can do with this chart is flip it upside down. So what this chart tells you is that apparently in 1978, a long time ago, nearly 40 years ago, 92% um, of people told a pollster that they had read at least one book that year. And today that number has dropped to 77. So another way to put that is 77% of people read at least one book a year in the United States. I'm sure it's more here. Um, and if you think about all the things that have happened since 1978, cable, television, the internet, video games, people having to work two jobs to pay the bills, everybody driving, fewer people commuting, all these things. This is not bad. There's a lot more competition for people's attention and I think people have less leisure time than they used to. So this is not bad. It gets even better though because the other thing that's been happening since 1978 in the United States, but pretty much everywhere, um, population has been increasing and aging. So the number of adults in the United States in 1978 is much lower, nearly, nearly 100 million lower than it is in 2014. So the fact that percentage is going down isn't telling you the whole story. The truth is, in terms of the number, not percentage, but number of American adults that have read a book in the last year has gone up. And it's gone up substantially. So while it would be nice if everybody was reading and that that trend was, was, was more people reading a book a year than, than fewer, the fact of the matter is from a business perspective, the market for books is growing because of population. And you see this everywhere. We are living in this golden age of book sales. Oh my God, how is it we never hear about this on the essay pages of the New York Times or anywhere else? If you read these fact-free articles, you are being led to believe that nobody is buying books anymore. Well, more people are buying books than ever before. In fact, let's go back to the rampaging monster of video games. On a unit basis, books are far outselling video games, even though books are a very mature technology and video games are very new. So video games not taking away from books. What is it taking away from? Well, if you'd, if you'd had this talk, if we'd had this talk in uh, probably the 50s, the days of the screaming white people, um, we would have been bemoaning this new technology called television. Television was coming and television was going to steal our readers. Here's what's happened to television recently. Again, these are US numbers, um, but this is a trend that's reasonably common. And the US is you know, probably the most robust TV market. They like to be like this guy and, and sit on the couch with their <laughs> with their you know, cheeseburger or whatever and, and, uh, and watch TV. Uh, the number of people watching primetime broadcast television is dropping rapidly. That's the kind of thing that is being affected by things like video games. It's not reading. <clears throat> but that's not the most interesting thing about this wonderful golden age of reading. People aren't just reading recipe books or how-to books. Um, <clears throat> I, I thought this was amazing. This is in August, and this happened all over the world. This picture is from New York, but uh, this 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 happened everywhere. We have this this book, the 
colorless Sukuru Tazaki and his Years of Pilgrimage by Haruki Murakami. A Japanese writer writing in Japanese, and when the translation comes out in English, bookstores are holding midnight parties for all the people that can't wait to get their hands on it. So this is what I say to Will Self and his lack of deep, serious readers. This is a novel, if you haven't read it, I, I recommend it. It's beautifully written and beautifully translated, um, in which not very much happens, frankly. This is not, uh, if they make this into a movie, I don't recommend you go see it, right? It's, this is not, you know, The Hunger Games. And while everybody gets hung up on oh, everyone's looking at the internet, a large proportion of what people are doing on the internet is not watching movies or listening to music. In one form or another, it's reading. And it may sometimes be, you know, 10 things you never knew about when it gets snowy in Toronto or, you know, whatever, right? But not always. I write articles online, I get the data. The longer ones do better than the shorter ones, and I can see on some, some of the, the places where I publish whether people get to the end or not. So not everything people is re are reading online is, is, is lightweight. And here's why. And here's the big point. And here's the thing that is the most important thing. In that same period when, you know, a few Americans didn't read a book one year, global literacy practically doubled. Okay? So in 1970, not that long ago, about two-thirds of the world could read. And today it's getting close to 90%, and we're probably going to cross that 90% mark very soon. So this is not the end of reading. This is the beginning of reading. And this is a trend that's been going on since the beginning of the 1800s. We can forget that a few hundred years ago, practically nobody could read anywhere in the world. And I know that we can get <coughs> very focused on our own lifetimes. And this can seem like a long time. It's not. So let's look at this chart another way. Let's imagine, as I think, you know, quite a few people were, that you were born around 1975. If you were born around 1975, and your family has a typical generational cycle, which is about 25 years, you know, the average age at first birth in the world is around 25, what are the chances your grandparents could read? Now, we're assuming that you have global grandparents. We don't know where they were born. But the chances your grandparents could read if you were born in 1975 is about 30%. Your grandparents. Now, chances are, for most people, your grandparents were born somewhere around here, so the odds for them are higher. But depending on where you're from, globally, they would be 30%. Your great-grandparents, 21%. And your three times great grandparents, less than 20%. The point is, you don't have to go back very many generations before none of your ancestors can read. This is not the end of reading, this is the beginning of reading. And if we look at this globally, Interestingly, neither the United States or Canada make the top 10 most literate nations in the world, according to UNESCO. They come in at 99%. Um, but what's interesting about this to me is the 10 least literate nations. The least literate nation in the world for which we have data, and we have data for most of them, there are a few sort of island nations and places where we don't, um, is South Sudan with a 27% literary rate i.e. it's higher than the world was 70 years ago. This is how fast the world is learning to read. It's remarkable. And so, 
Let's talk about what's driving that, because that's really relevant. This is 50,000 years of human history. Um, from the point of view of reading, nothing really happened between 50,000 years and 3,500 years, so please note there's a gap in the axis here. Um, and we go along and, and you know, um, eventually we, right here, this is why I say it's a golden age of reading, right, the chart suddenly goes crazy. Now, if I didn't tell you what this chart represented, and I said, yes, this period here is when this thing stopped happening and it all went into decline, you would think I was crazy. And I would be crazy. So what's driving this? Part of what's driving this, in fact, a lot of what's driving this, is technology. Okay, this is Tech Forum. Let's talk about technology. Um, there was nothing to read for a very long time apart from cave paintings, which is what this first symbol here represents. And gradually, cave paintings became cuneiform and hieroglyphic, sort of pictographic writing schemes. Um, but, you know, e even then, it was, it was a thousand years after hieroglyphics that the Egyptians happened upon papyrus. Uh, before that, it was clay and walls and stone and things. Um, and then it was another thousand years before we moved to a more kind of alphabetic way of writing, i.e. moving away from pictograms and having symbols that, rec that represent sounds. So this is the Phoenician alphabet about, you know, 1500 years BCE. Um, paper didn't happen until, you know, about 10 BCE in China. Uh, printing started uh, in the early hundreds. And it was one wood block and you cut the whole thing and you, you stuck it down. Uh, there was probably a conference back then about how printing was the end of, end of reading, right? Um, and yeah, gradually that moved to movable type, first of all in wood and then in metal. Uh, the most you know, sort of famous, at least in North America and, and Europe, example of movable metal type is probably the Gutenberg Press. That didn't happen until 1450. We'll talk about that a little bit more in, in a moment. So, first of all, there was nothing to read because nobody could write. And then even though you could write, there wasn't very much way to dis distribute writing in any, any significant way. But then when we moved to, to, to movable type and industrial scale printing presses, you know, we end up fairly quickly, a few hundred years later, with the emergence of these things called public libraries. And then only in the end of the 1800s did somebody have the idea that it would be useful if the population could read, and that's when elementary schools started all over the world. And one of the things that suddenly become elementary was reading. And then, as people start to graduate from elementary schools, we have another, the original book ellipse, probably. Oh my God, paperback novels in the 1930s. Intimately, uh, by the way, um, connected to the development of railways. People were, were wanting something to read on the, the railway train and they were buying newspapers at railway stations and somebody had the idea, oh, what if we had, the, there was this paperback format, but they were trashy novels. What if we put good, good, good writing into paperbacks? Paperbacks happened. That helped drive literature even higher. And then we end up in, you know, the last few decades, things like hypertext and e-readers. But the point here is, notice, and obviously this is very large scale, and some of the dates are approximate, and I've picked just a few things from the timeline. But Every time we see a significant technology to do with reading, like movable type or paperback books, literacy increases. And that's a feedback loop. Technology is feeding literacy, and literacy is causing a need for new technology. And that is a trend we see everywhere, but it's certainly the trend we see in reading. And to put it into microcosm, here's the history of reading in Canada. Now, there's not great data, at least not that I could find, about literacy in Canada. So these numbers are somewhat approximate. You have a little clue here and a little cute clue there. And what do we mean by literacy? Does it mean you can sign your name? Or does it mean you can read a road sign? What does it mean? But basically, you see the same thing. I mean, the first printing press, by the way, didn't arrive in Canada until 1750. So it's, it's less than 300 years since there was a printing press here. Um, 
And, you know, booksellers kind of emerged later. A lot of the printing presses were printing pam pamphlets and newspapers mainly. The Clockmaker, which is kind of the probably one of the first that I could find anyway, you know, sort of novels written by a Canadian in Canada, um, sort of in the early 1800s. You know, the same as the rest of the world, you started to see libraries and schools at the end of the 1800s. 1900, you have the first kind of million dollar, million uh, unit Canadian authored selling novel sold around the world, the Sky Pilot. Um, Quill and Choir, which is still going, you know, emerges to support this. Do I hear a whoop from the audience? Hey, shout out. Um, sort of emerged in the 1930s to start this sort of monitoring this, this new trade of Canadian publishing. Um, the Manatee is the first Harlequin book. Uh, so that was kind of in the 1950s, so somewhat analogous to the emergence of, emergence of penguin paperbacks in the, in the 30s. Um, you know, in the 70s, the Canadian government starts sort of developing some protection for the Canadian publishing industry. And then, you know, 2009, I think it is, we, we get the Kobo. The, you know, the Canadian e-reader that's sort of taken over the world. So again, you see these upticks in literacy that are coincident with changes in technology or society around publishing. Which leads me to the problem that the ebook must solve. And I'm really going to talk about the problem and then leave it to other people to tell you what the solution is, because uh, I don't know. But the population of the planet is increasing, and the literacy rate is increasing. And if you do the math, what that means is we'll probably be at 100% literacy by about the end of the century, which is about the time the human population will exceed 10 billion people. Which means that from now, well, from a few years ago, say 2000, the number of readers in the world will double. This century, the number of readers in the world will double from about 4 billion to about 10 billion. That's the point. That's the revolution. That's the major historic transition that is happening because of technology partly and because of society. That's the problem we have to solve. That's why I say this is not the end of reading, this is the beginning of reading. Here's a problem. You would have to grow and, and, and chop down nearly 20 million trees a year if you were going to supply two books to each of those readers annually. Having a, having a world where books are exclusively made of paper does not scale to the needs of a literate global population. It's nice when only a few people can read. It doesn't work when everybody can read. I love printed books on paper. I have thousands of the damn things. But they do not scale. They are a transitional reading technology. E-readers may also be a transitional reading technology. Because everybody has a portable screen in their pocket nowadays. Now, you will not be surprised to know that in the United States, 90% of people have a cell phone. You may be surprised to know that in Africa, 85% of people have a cell phone. Now, most of those phones today are not smartphones, but they are about to be smartphones. A few years from now, about 90% of people in Africa, which is a country that if you watch only American cable news, you think is full of starving babies swatting flies from their eyes, 90% of Africans will have a cell phone, most of those will be smart in the next few years. 
people all over, and this is the same, same is true in Asia, by the way, people are gonna have screens in their pockets, connected screens in their pockets. You know, maybe we can't, we can't make 10 billion e-readers either, if we're also making 10 billion smartphones. Maybe the thing you read on is not in your pocket. We're also moving to the age of the self-driving car very quickly. What are you gonna do in your self-driving car? You're probably gonna stare at a screen. Maybe the screen won't be in your pocket. Maybe the screen will be where the windshield is. Maybe you'll have your library on a screen in your car, and as you're you know, making your way from A to B, or your car is for you, reading is what you do. Changes in transportation gave us the paperback. Maybe changes in transportation will give us some other way to consume e-books. Maybe this is the e-reader of the future. This is also coming very fast now. Virtual reality has been talked about for decades, but there are a number of consumer products emerging onto the market which are very good. I have no idea what you would do if you were reading a book like this with these goggles on. Apart from, you know, everyone, everyone, every picture of people using this technology, they kind of, oh, oh. <laughs> I, I'm just going to set up um, Nathan from Kobo a little bit here. Because the other thing to think about before I close is, well, in addition to the problem of scale, what else can you do with e-books that you can't do today with, with regular books? Um, and Kobo had this wonderful press release where they had a report and they are monitoring what books get finished. So this is kind of a, a percentage of uh, by genre, um, how, man, how many people finish a particular book in a particular country in a particular genre. The, the thing I love about this, you can't make these names up. We had Will Self and now we have this lady, Francine Prose, writing in the, the New York Review of Books, which I don't think has ever reviewed a book I've ever heard of some biography of some guy, the third volume, and who was the guy, I don't know. Um, and you know, 82% of readers lost interest in, and notice it's a memoir that Francine is thinking of here. These people love their memoirs. Um, lost interest on page 272, and, and the publisher is telling the writer about it, and this is terrible, apparently. So the same people who bemoan the end of reading and the lack of serious readers also don't want to know that people aren't reading their books. So they do their screamy white person face. This is good data. We need to know this. This is helpful. Um, you know, what you see as we think about ebooks is that the new technology always starts off by copying the old technology. So this is a Bible, a manuscript Bible in 1250. This is the Gutenberg Bible using movable type. It looks pretty much the same, right? The, the colored bits are done by hand. Um, but of course now, we do interesting things with typography and movable type. There's really not much reason technically why you couldn't have done this with the Gutenberg press. It just didn't occur to anybody because we had to get our heads around it. Um, same thing happened in movies. So this is a stage play called Arsenic and Old Lace from 1939. Um, and this is the very good movie with Cary Grant, which I recommend, which looks exactly the same, right? The framing and the blocking is exactly the same as if you're watching a stage play. Um, this is a Wes Anderson movie today. This is not a special effect, right? You could technically, you could have probably done this shot in the 40s, but it just didn't occur to anybody because we were figuring out the new medium. So this is kind of the image I sort of want to leave you with in a way. It's like, this is us. We're sort of staring into the future. Um, how, how will the book transform for the new medium of the ebook? That's the question we must answer because this is the problem we must solve. By 2100, there will be 10 billion readers, there will be 100% global literacy. That is the good news, unless you're one of the white elite, in which case, ah, ah. Ah, ah, run away, run away from the masses. Please buy my book. <laughs> you mentioned video games. I just came back from PAX East in Boston. Oh, lucky yeah. you. Yeah, it was great. Um, I wanted to ask, do you consider video games a form of reading? No, at least not when I do them. <laughs>
I mean, sometimes I have to turn on the subtitles because I'm too old to understand what these, these people are saying anymore. I think they're a form of storytelling a lot of the time, not always. Um, and that's interesting. But they, to, to me, video games look more like a medium to rival uh, movies and stuff like that than, than books. And what I notice is when you look at kids' habits, the video time game has gone up. Well, the video game time has gone up, but reading time has stayed the same. So I don't, I don't think one is cannibalizing the other, at least not, not very much, that's my guess. Um, it's just old people don't like video games, so they blame them for things. Thank you, Noah.